everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of The Welcome Table with Tatum and Sydney. Today we are talking to Dr. Maria Gratia Sunan. Um, Dr. Maria Gratia Sunan has her PhD in French language and also in literature from the University at Buffalo. She's also the recipient of the same award of one of our other interviewees, mm -hmm. uh, Felix, Dr. Felix. So it is the um, 2020 to the 2021 American Council of Learned Societies, and it's a fellowship at UCI, and we're very excited that she's here. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Good. <laughs> How are you? Doing well, doing well. You know, week 10, so, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And before we usually get started to our interview, we have our show and tell. So I'm going to go this week. Mm -hmm. So I brought one of my first playbills from the first, I think that, yeah, this was one of the first um, musicals that I went to go see. So it's Wicked. I'm sure lots of people know Wicked, but yeah, it's one of my favorite musicals. I love it so much. And yeah, I kept the playbill and I went to, since then I went to go see it like two more times and a couple more musicals in between here and there. So yeah, yeah that's my that, that was That was in, uh, I, um, in Irvine or you traveled to New York City? Yeah, I went to go see it at the Pantages Theater, oh, okay. which okay. is in uh, LA. Oh, Hollywood. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. very cool. Thank you. What did you bring to share with us today? Well, <laughs> I brought um, this painting. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, wow. Um, That's beautiful. So my mom, she went to um, Senegal a few years ago, mm -hmm. and she went to, uh, she visited um, Gory Island. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Gory I Island. Uh, but basically, that's where this place shift departed to the the Atlantic. Um, oh. So there's a there's a they, there's a lot of tourism there. So um, they they went on the island and then they went where there, there's the door of no return. Um, that's where once the slave passed that threshold, they could never kind of come back. That was the the, the last the last time they were in in on African land. So mm -hmm. before the you know the, they were kidnapped and enslaved. So so um so when she visited she brought by this painting and um what I well I, we love collecting African arts because oh. we, we don't live in Africa anymore but um whenever we have an opportunity to collect we 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 um we love you know we love any mm -hmm. any any type really so what I really like about this one is that it's made of sand and so yeah, I was you know, noticing there was some texture there yeah definitely that the, the, the some red soil sand um oh. and then there's some gray shades of gray and then there's black of course but um I mean, I, I don't know if you can see, but it's basically just a, a picture of a, I mean, a drawing of a, a mother and child. Mm -hmm. And you see how the, 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 the connecting of mother and child mm -hmm. showcase here. And yeah. so, yeah, I thought I'll bring, I'll share some African art because we don't, we don't get to see enough of it. Yes, yeah, that's true. Um, and so... Um, I thought I'd share a little something from home. That's beautiful. Um, it is. That's amazing. Yeah, so we loved hearing about your mom and a little bit about your background. Can we ask a little bit more about how you grew up? Like, what got you interested in studying the French language and literature? Did you grow up in a French-speaking household? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, those are wonderful questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I... I'm a Togolese born American. Um, I moved to the United States when I was a teenager. Okay. And so um, I, both of my high school years were, were, in, the United, were, were in the United States. Um, so as a point of reference, um, I just want to mention that um, Togo's right next to Ghana. Um, I don't know if that helps um, a, a little bit, we kind of picture, because people don't know 
too much about Togo. It's a really tiny country. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm, I was born. And um, when I moved to the United States, I focused on learning English. Mm-hmm. So from 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 living in Togo to to high school and everything, I I just pretty much focused on that. So once I got to to college to undergrad, I. I, I kind of, uh, I started having this feeling to kind of learn more about my blackness, learn about um, uh, my, my, more about my roots. Um, and so, um, and call, undergrad was a, a time where I was really, like I became even so like more, way more aware of my race and how my race in the United States affected my quality of life. And mm-hmm. so, you know, because I Togo, everybody's black. Your heroes and villains are black. In the United States, it's, it's a little different. So um, that's what kind of piqued my interest. I I really wanted to learn more about Francophone literature. Um, and so, and then I I met a professor who was offering a course, a Francophone literature course in French, and. And so I took his course initially, and then over time, I, 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 I kept taking more courses, mm-hmm. and yeah, and so that's that's how it started. Yeah, that's really awesome. Started. Interesting. Yeah. Start of your journey, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then also like learning about your blackness in a new place in the context of what America is and what it represents. That's super super interesting. Um, when you were like, you know, making that journey and like, hey, I'm gonna learn a little bit more about my blackness. Um, And you were, you know, reading a whole bunch of books. What what authors stood out to you most? I know that's a hard question because there's so many great ones, but yeah, we just like to know. One of the early ones that I, I, that piqued my interest was Usman Samben. He's one of the first, Francophone, uh, Francophone uh, filmmakers. So I was exposed to his film in undergrad, um, and I got a chance to um, watch him. I had heard of him growing up because I had read his um, his novels in the past. But he he's also a filmmaker, mm-hmm. and so um, watching his films about um, uh, Senegal colonial history, for example, um, the um, women in Senegal, um, their subjectivity, like the, the different issues that are so relevant to the human condition, um, um, was very present in, in his work. Um, and so, um, in in also grad, grad school, um, I I became more familiar with Marie Condé. She's a uh, Francophone Caribbean author. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Marie Vieux Chauvet. She's Haitian. And I read many of her books, um, and they're just amazing. Um, there's, there, she, has, she has works on Haitian, Haitian Revolution. Um, she has a book that talks about the Duvalier um, regime, um, dictatorship in Haiti. And she even talks about colorism in one of her texts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of that formed, and of course, Frank Fanon, as you know, um, you know, his theories on race um, and the 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 black the, the black person in white spaces, all those theories um, on blackness, all of that shaped um, my my interest in in uh, Francophone literature um, and yeah. French language. Yeah. Of course, yeah, you're just soaking it all up, soaking it all in. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and that kind of draws us to our our next question. We did some reading and we know that a lot of your research has to do with um, body aesthetics and oppression of transnational black women. And we're really interested, um, what got you interested in that? We know that you mentioned a lot of your most respected authors that you've been reading since your undergrad experience, but what led you to focusing on that specifically? Well, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question. There's, there's so many things led me to to taking um, uh, transnational black womanhood, 
establishment of the activities, black women in visibility in North Atlantic spaces. Um, but I have, if I, if I were to pick an example, I would say uh, after watching um, Black Venus um, by Ab Abdelatish Keshish, um, he's a, Tunisian, a French Tunisian um, filmmaker and he did a, a he made a historical uh, drama on, on Sarah Bartman, the authentic Venus. And so that it was, it was such an experience watching that film. It was, the, the, I had such a visceral reaction. And so I, I thought, I, I, I was inspired to, to further um, look into um, that, that, that topic. Um, and so um, it made me think about a Black women's experience when they migrate, when they migrate for work. For opportunities for a better life, and or for to find agency um, through um, economic freedom. So all of that um, and kind of helps me hone in and zone in on the specific, uh, specific uh, that specific topic. Mm -hmm. uh, just black women, it, it, you know that, it, and these experiences reflect real. Uh, these these are um, most of the work I've done is in fiction, but it kind of trickles down and back to real life black women. And, and so, right. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah Bartman, it, it was it was a real life person, so yeah, that's, just, that's how it originally started. Right. Just the idea of the black Venus. I actually just learned about uh, Sarah Bartman in my black studies class, and that story is like you said, heart-wrenching and, and very powerful. Just the idea that they gave this girl the name Venus as almost a joke, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, right. it's it's just uh, very much related to uh, Black women autonomy and then just like disrespect towards the Black women community, like you were saying, it, it's just, it's very interesting that you would bring up that story, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a very and, real and, story. Right, and, and to add to your point, how hyper sexualized her body is, you know, mm -hmm. that was also something that was just that I think every black woman can relate to that in some way. Yes. But to, to see a display on the screen in such a way was just so, so shocking. It mm -hmm. was, I, I don't even know what adjective I can use really, but it was just wow, it was, mm -hmm. it was really 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 surprising mm -hmm. uh, the extent at which that happened right um honing in on that like i mean it's obvious to us but why is it so 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 important to research and talk openly about transnational black womanhood mm -hmm. well first i believe that there's not enough enough um research done um, I think most, what I believe, uh, I should say, that most of the people who talk about Black women are Black women. Mm -hmm. We need more. And so it, it is as if um, Black women who contribute, have, who, who contribute or have contributed um, so much to history around the world, sometimes they're, they're overlooked, their stories are overlooked. So I thought I'll contribute in a in a way, um, in a my in a small way, to Black women stories, Black women subjectivity that needs to be more visible, because um, it seems as though the world tends to just categorize them in 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 a in a kind of hypersexual, um, or keeps them in a in a in a at a in a position that. She's unable to kind of like um, graduate out of. While there's actually there, there there's there's black the, the black women themselves, uh, whether in fiction or in real life, that are doing the work that are um, creating a community, building community uh, to lift each other up. So yeah. or to heal from traumas. Mm -hmm. But we don't. There the, the, there's not enough. We need to see that more to inspire. Um, each other, but also the younger generation representation, the proper visibility that really, uh, um, 
that really would make a, a, a good a great difference in someone in, in other black women's lives because mm-hmm. we've seen the same negative negative portrayals all, portrayals all the that like you, you see all the time mm-hmm. and so um i think it's important to continue to talk about it continue to talk about it in any shape or form really mm-hmm. um and so that's why i believe it's really important to talk about um uh, black women, black women, domestic black women, um, the the one the ones in the United States, immigrant black women, so you know, there's all types of black women. Um, they all deserve to, they all deserve that visibility. When we're talking about it now, like I just get kind of chills sometimes because for so long, like I feel like it was just, even still today, we're all. It seems like we're always fighting this negative overhanging this negative little umbrella around us right and it's so Mm -hmm. difficult at times but in conversations with people like Tatum and people like you um it makes me feel a little bit better that like someone else understands and we can talk about this openly like how we're doing right now so thank you for that yeah and that boils down to doing that corrective work that you were talking about you know that's that's such an interesting term because you know you would a lot of people think oh you know racism's over or whatever it's very much not there's still a lot of work to do corrective visibility and promotion in media you know yeah mm-hmm. correctly promotion in media awesome. too um and i i you know what i really like when i and when i sometimes when i i watch the news and i see a a, a black women in media and politics kind of standing up for for change and saying we're not going to accept this anymore Mm-hmm. Um, and and we see real life images: our mothers, our sisters, working who are not just stereotypes, you know. And so, um, I I I just like seeing uh, black women demanding better, and also making space for themselves. We're seeing that a lot as well. Yeah. Can you give us an example of a time that you've had to create space and demand space within your own career? In undergrad, I I was a part of BSU, mm-hmm. and so we, you know, we had a lot of there was there was a, it was a predominantly white school, so we were always kind of struggling being away from home, and that was a space for us where we we create the room for us to talk about um, important issues, and you know what's interesting. That was the first um, time I ever heard of Sarah Bartman. Even though, I mean, my experience as an was ne- not nearly as tragic as, as Sarah Bartman's. But that was the time where we, even though the conversation was uncomfortable, we, we, try, we tried to kind of make that room to have that, those difficult conversations. Yeah, and, and I've, I've kind of, I've, it's also done that um, in other situations, you know, in courses where I felt like I wasn't being heard, which which is difficult to kind of manage. But sometimes you have to speak up for, for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. like so. And and as someone who is an immigrant and who has an accent, I had to prove myself a lot because um, you know I wasn't always taken seriously um so because yeah like so, so people you know people assume you're not smart because you sound different or mm-hmm. you know so I've there, there's been instances where I'll tell them look I'm in the same school where we're in the same class I'm progressing you're progressing what's the problem you know um and um yeah, like I, I was when I was in undergrad. Also, I went I studied abroad, and there was a bit of that happening with my colleagues. I had, were from different backgrounds, and I, and I said, you know, we, you know, we're all here. You know, we're, you know, why pick on the person who might be different from you? You know, so it, it, all, it all depends. Like I, yeah. I, I approached them about it, and I think over time they saw that. They, you know, maybe they needed to. Um, they they needed to maybe reevaluate how they 
talk to people that mm -hmm. went out from the same background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that with us, of course. Um, you're so wonderful. <laughs> We're so happy to have you here at UCI. Um, how did you, can you tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how you went from, you know, at Buffalo with your uh, PhD and then how you came over here to UCI? So I, I was finishing up my dissertation when the pandemic started. Mm. And so I was nervous about my defense it's being canceled and all, you know, all that. It's so much, there was so much going on at the time. And so um, I was, but, but fortunately I was able to, um, well, everything moved uh, remotely. Uh, we were working on, online. So um, I was able to keep my defense days and I, I defended and, and, you know, I did, I just, I, I was just, I was ready to move on to the next step. So mm -hmm. luckily everything went well with my defense. And um, and so, I, but, but I was also kind of nervous having finished after many years in school because uh, the pandemic started and I wasn't sure what the future, what the future um, had in store for me, what was, was going to happen with jobs that people, I, I kept hearing about Funding and being, you know, funding being, funding being cut in a lot of schools, and, and so I was nervous, definitely. But then my advisor had nominated me for the this for the fellow for the the fellowship, and then um, then at this university level, I was selected, and then I applied, and then and and luckily, um, I. I, I I was able to land the position, and so I'm I'm just so grateful and happy for the opportunity. Yeah, congratulations! That's a huge accomplishment, mm -hmm. and I'm sure a relief during a period like this. You know. Yes, yes. I I it was it was just I did not expect that at all. It was just because so much people were losing their jobs. It it, it was just. And I'm just so grateful, so grateful mm -hmm. to be here. Of course. Um, what are some things that you hope to gain from the ACLS um, fellowship? I, well, I would like to um, teach, well, continue teaching, conti continue teaching my research, mm -hmm. uh, share with students and also hear what they think about it. Because you never know. You you all have you, you think about things maybe in a different way than I would, and so we can students and teachers can both learn from each other. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to share my some of my research with my students and um, get their feedback, and also I hope they learn a little something from me, um, from from the courses, from the, the books we're gonna read. Um, the films we're gonna watch, the documentaries, and all that. So I hope they, um, I hope they, um, I'm hoping for that, and I hope to also get feedback from my from my research from um, seasoned professors here, um, and um, of course my my uh, my mentor Kerry Nolan. Um, yeah, so we've been working and. She's been giving me feedback along with other faculty members in nice. the European um, um, studies, language and studies department. Yeah. Amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're working on or what you're going to be working on? So, I mean, at this point, we're just like brainstorming and we, we haven't said anything, said anything in stone yet, um, but we, we did have in a a work in progress seminar last month on my research. So I, I was able to um, get feedback from various departments about um, a chapter of mine in my dissertation and it was an amazing experience. I, I got great uh, uh, feedback, constructive feedback. And so that, that that's all I can ask for. So um, just revising my work, revising chapters. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we wanted to ask, um, what are some of your, some of your long-term or um, shorter term goals for the future? Mm -hmm. Well, long-term, continue to teach and work on my research. Because uh, you, you, you can never be done, um, <laughs> you can never be done with revising and revising as my former advisor would say. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna continue working on it. Think, think of new, new ways to expand on my research. Um, so those are my main goals. Um, and also, well, short-term goals: stay healthy, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> health-wise, yeah. um, and stay active. And do our movement outside the home is limited. Maintain a healthy lifestyle and saying this mental mental uh, health um those are very important because without great health you can't function well you know exactly. you can't give a hundred percent yeah <laughs> of school or te teaching or you know so um yeah that's those are my <laughs> those are my small 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 goals <laughs> yeah well sometimes those seem pretty big when you're like you're trying to juggle so much stuff but I think achieving balance like you're talking about is a super great way to keep on track and mm -hmm. stay sane especially right now and you know also crazy. we're going through a global pandemic so staying healthy is the primary focus for most individuals right now is number one <laughs> thank you so much for talking with us Thank you for having me. It's so great. Um, we appreciate you so much for coming on the show. We had such a great time talking to you. Well, have a good evening. Okay, you too. Bye. 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 Um, thank you guys for, again, joining us for another episode of The Welcome Table. This has been Sydney and Tatum. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.